Tomorrow morning, the Senate Banking Committee works on a financial regulation bill. The measure would create an independent agency to identify risk in the nation's financial system. Live coverage of the markup starts at 10 a.m. Eastern on C-SPAN 3. Washington, D.C. Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton has introduced two bills that would remove congressional review of newly passed D.C. laws and budgets. D.C. Mayor Adrian Fenty and others testified in support of the bills earlier. Stephen Lynch of Massachusetts chairs the Oversight Subcommittee on the District of Columbia. Good morning, the Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce, Postal Service, and the District of Columbia hearing now will come to order. I want to welcome Ranking Member Chaffetz, members of the Subcommittee, our Chairman, Ed Towns, a gentleman from New York, uh, all those uh, witnesses and also those in attendance at today's hearing. Uh, the purpose of today's hearing is to examine the merits and potential impact of H.R. 960, the District of Columbia Legislative Autonomy Act of 2009, and H.R. 1045, the District of Columbia Budget Autonomy Act of 2009, collectively. Uh, these measures introduced by Representative Eleanor Norton Holmes are intended to advance the concept of self-governance in the District of Columbia. The Chairman, Ranking Member, and Subcommittee members will each have five minutes to make opening statements, and all members will have three days to submit <coughs> statements for the record. Before I get started with my statement today, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that the statement of Robert Branham, the Chairman of the 5th District Citizens Advisory Council, be entered into the record. Hearing no objections, that is so ordered. As mentioned earlier, the subcommittee convenes today, uh, le today's legislative hearing to examine H.R. 960, the District of Columbia Legislative Autonomy Act of 2009, and H.R. 1045, the District of Columbia Autonomy Act, Budgetary Autonomy Act of 2009, which are two bills in a series of legislative proposals introduced by Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton to promote greater autonomy and self-governance for the residents and elected officials of the District of Columbia. Established by Article I, Section 8, Clause 17 of the United States Constitution, the District of Columbia came to be our nation's capital in order to protect the institutions of national government and to prevent the disproportionate influence of any particular state. In establishing the seat of the federal government, the Constitution granted Congress exclusive legislative control over the District of Columbia. However, since ratification of the District Clause, Congress has employed various approaches to municipal governance in the nation's capital. Uh, most notably, in 1973, Congress enacted the District of Columbia Self-Government and Governmental Reorganization Act, also known as the Home Rule Act. The Home Rule Act created the district's current governing structure, complete with a duly elected mayor and city council, thereby setting the nation's capital on the road toward self-governance. While the Home Rule Act of 1973 represented a significant step forward for the city's municipality, the act also came with an array of checks and balances, such as the requirement that Congress review all locally passed legislation, as well as the district's annual budget, before final enactment can occur. Although the Home Rule Act attempted to strike a balance between Congress's constitutionally derived authority and the need to delegate aspects of this power to a local government, the fact of the matter is that the certain provisions of the Act have created a costly and sometimes unpredictable public policy-making process and an unaccommodating fiscal budget cycle for the city. It is for these reasons that my colleague, Ms. Norton, has introduced H.R. 960 and H.R. 1045 to do away with certain aspects of Congress's review authority as outlined in the provisions of the Home Rule Act. Specifically, H.R. 960, the District of Columbia Legislative Autonomy Act of 2009, would eliminate the 30 and 60 day congressional review periods for criminal and civil laws passed by the district government. Along the same lines, H.R. 1045, the District of Columbia Budgetary Autonomy Act of 2009, would remove the statutory requirement that Congress annually approve the district's fiscal year budget, which is principally raised from local revenue sources. While collectively, H.R. 960 and H.R. 1045 will fundamentally reshape the way Congress is involved in the local legislative and budgetary matters of the nation's capital, nothing in either of the measures being discussed today can or will 
eliminate Congress's exclusive constitutional authority over the District of Columbia. In other words, Congress will retain the power to repeal or amend laws, local laws, through the routine passage of legislation and its right to annually review the myriad of federal payments to the District of Columbia. That said, the subcommittee is interested in exploring the pros and cons of these two proposals and pro-home rule measures, which is the main purpose of today's hearing. The district is home to nearly 575,000 tax-paying American citizens, many of whom have served in our nation's armed forces and have gone to polls to elect their own city officials to carry out the business of local governments. Even in light of some of the city's ongoing policy challenges and its longstanding structural budget imbalance, the District of Columbia has made great strides over the past decade in its capacity to govern, which is why I believe today's discussion on revisiting Congress's approach to overseeing the legislative and budgetary matters of the nation's capital is certainly warranted. Again, I'd like to thank my colleagues, especially Eleanor Norm Holmes Norton, for her tireless work in this policy area and for bringing the concerns of her district to the forefront of this committee and this Congress's business. I welcome all those in attendance this afternoon. I look forward to hearing your testimony on these important legislative matters. And uh, I welcome my colleague, the ranking member, gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz, to offer a five minutes for opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. Our United States Constitution says Congress is, quote, to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district. I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman, now I recognize the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Eleanor Holmes Norton, for five minutes for an opening statement. I, th I thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome, uh, welcome uh, my good friends from the district, Mayor Fenty, um, Council Chair Gray, uh, the other witnesses at the table who are most expert in the affairs of the District of Columbia, more so than I or any of us in Congress could possibly be, but particularly, Mr. Chairman, do I want to thank you for affording us uh, this hearing, which helps us to reach uh, at least the goal I have set out here in the Congress uh, to have a hearing uh, this year and for the second half of, of the 111th Congress to see the Congress take the historic step of freeing the district from its paternalistic uh, oversight. Uh, and that is a very kind way, Mr. Chairman, to put it, if I may say so. This is an anachronism, but I don't think any American would be proud of the fact that a jurisdiction that raises $6 billion on its own can't spend a dime until the Congress says, yes, you may go, or would be proud of what we put our council through in order for uh, laws to become uh, final in the District of Columbia. If you lived in the Virgin Islands or Puerto Rico or Guam, I have good friends who are delegates from those territories. Uh, you never hear from the Congress of the United States attaching anything to your budget because they never see your budget. And by the way, they don't pay federal income taxes the way our residents do at a rate of second per capita in the United States. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Tom uh, Eagleton, uh, so that you will understand this is not so radical a proposal. In the original Home Rule Act, the Senate would indeed have given the district budget autonomy. Uh, in the compromises that always go on in this place, uh, that was uh, removed uh, so that the, Senate, the district has to come back. It has created huge operational problems and delays for the, the District of Columbia. And the notion that we would do it when we, the Congress of the United States, have the power to wipe out every law that the district passes anyway uh, because we retain, the Home Rule Act is a delegated authority. So we retain the authority to do whatever we want to the district, really emphasizes why it is time to, for the Congress to help the district uh, come into the, the 21st century. Mr. Chairman, I do want to uh, pay, give recognition to the minority, my friends in the minority, because during the 12 years when I was in the minority, I was able to negotiate two steps that make this the logical step. One was the mid-year budget autonomy bill. It will seem uh, um, astonishing to most Americans to know that in the middle of the year, the district had to come here to ask the Congress 
essentially if it could spend the money it, it collected the first half of the year. And so the district had to be on the first supplemental, creating another <laughs> delay for the district. Uh, the, when I was in the minority, that was given up and that, that bill was, was passed. And when I was in the minority, and this is why I believe this is and, sh and will be a bipartisan bill, when I was in the minority and pointed out uh, the um, hardships on the district of having our budget go uh, three or four months past even our September 30th deadline, they agreed, and now for at least half a dozen, perhaps 10 years, the district budget has gotten out on the first CR. But look at that. What is a CR? CR are government agencies, and therefore we are, continue to be treated as a government agency. There's a huge problem for the district that our budget year is attuned to the federal budget year, whereas in your district and in and Mr. Jaffes' district, uh, the budget year is over in, uh, by the summer. You can prepare for school. Our folks have to prepare for school, which is uh, one of the great, if not the overriding uh, uh, um, goal or uh, a tree, uh, 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 issue in the District of Columbia, uh, without its budget in hand. It has created terrible problems in the past uh, when the budget was, was delayed. The legislative autonomy is even more laughable. This is the budget autonomy seems to me speaks for itself. Most people don't know what Chairman Gray and the council go through in order to get a bill to be final. And I'm going to let him describe uh, a process that is not even used in the Congress anymore. That is to say we do not indeed use resolutions of disapproval. You've never uh, had one brought from my colleagues on the other side and certainly not from us. Uh, we don't uh, issue a resolution of disapproval, go and vote on it here, and then go and vote on the Senate. But we require the district to act as if we did. So the district has to come here uh, and wait for 30 legislative days or 60 legislative days if it is a criminal matter. Well, we're not in for five legislative days most or many, many days. So the district's laws can go many months without being final. And yet we say to Mayor Fenty, and Chairman Gray, you run that city and you make sure you run it efficiently. And if you don't, you will hear from people up here saying you're not a very efficient city. No jurisdiction in the United States is faced with such handicaps, particularly handicaps for which there is no reason today. If the reason is control, you retain the, the control. Uh, you will hear, finally, the um, CFO, the Chief Financial Officer, talk about the cost the real cost to the city, which is not a state, in having redundant oversight from the Congress of the United States. Mr. Chairman, uh, you as uh, Chairman, Chairman Towns, uh, my good friend, uh, Mr. Kafritz, uh, have an opportunity, it seems to me, to uh, do for the district what was done for the district in 1974, take the historic step of giving the district the last two important elements of home rule for the District of Columbia. And I couldn't thank you enough for what you've done for us today. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, I would like to uh, go out of order just to allow uh, the full chairman of the committee, uh, the gentleman from Brooklyn, New York, uh, Mr. Towns, five minutes for an opening statement. We, we thank him for his attendance here today. Thank you very much, um, Congressman Lynch. Uh, I would like to thank Congressman Lynch and uh, Congressman Chafee for holding this hearing on autonomy for the District of Columbia. And thank my good friend, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, for her hard work on behalf of the district. Uh, and let me again thank the witnesses for their attendance here today. I want to let you know we really appreciate your being here. Uh, welcome uh, Mayor Fenty and on behalf of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. And I thank the mayor for his attendance this morning. And I want to thank Councilman Brown. I want to thank Councilman Gray and other elected and appointed officials for coming. I support home rule and self-governance in the district. Over the years, the district has achieved great independence. And of course, this has been done through the district's own advocacy. 
The adoption of the Home Rule Act and the end of involvement by the control board in the district's finances, among other measures, the district has steadily proved its ability to manage its own affairs, even passing a balanced budget during an economic crisis that has greatly affected many state and local governments. I applaud the progress that has been made in the district and your efforts to implement the principle of home rule. I look forward to working uh, very closely with uh, Congresswoman Norton and, of course, uh, Chairman Lynch and uh, uh, the ranking member, Congressman Chafee, uh, and, of course, you too, uh, Mayor, F Mayor Fenty, uh, to make certain that home rule is a reality. Now, I know that it has been a long battle, long struggle, but I think we have to continue the fight and be able to continue to push on. My son, who serves in the State Assembly in New York, says to me, he says, you know, Dad, sometimes people just catch on faster than others. There's a thing called individual differences. He says, um, sometimes it takes some people two and a half hours to watch 60 Minutes. Doesn't mean they can't watch it, just take them a lot longer. So we, we hope that um, as we continue to talk about the importance of home rule, that eventually the other members of Congress will get it and understand how important it is to move this forward. Congresswoman Norton, keep pushing. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings, for five thank minutes. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I uh, want to thank you and Mr. Chafee for holding this vitally important hearing to examine two pieces of legislation that would increase autonomy for the federal taxpaying residents of the District of Columbia. H.R. 960, the District of Columbia Legislative Autonomy Act of 2009, and H.R. 1045, the District of Columbia Budget Autonomy Act of 2009. I appreciate the opportunity to move forward uh, on these pieces of legislation as part of Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton Free and Equal D.C. Legislative Initiative. And I must say to Ms. Norton, I thank you for all that you do. You have constantly been on the battlefield on this issue and so many others. And you have convinced, you had to convince some of us and then to bring others of us along to do the right thing. But you know that there are many who are on your side. We just got to get a few more. In the Constitution, the district clause was crafted to help protect federal interests without state cooperation and to prevent particular state influences on the legislature where the federal capital was located. Mr. Chairman's time has changed. The residents of District of Columbia deserve a government that operates for them as effectively and efficiently as possible. And these two pieces of legislation would help achieve this goal. H.R. 960, the District of Columbia Legislative Autonomy Act of 2009, would eliminate congressional review of newly passed district laws. Since the Home Rule Act established the local district government in 1973, by allowing constituents to elect a mayor and city council, Congress has rarely taken advantage of the review process to overturn past legislation. In fact, only once has a resolution of disapproval been signed by the President. That was President Bush in 1991 who signed a resolution that was related to restricting the height of buildings in the district. This process imposes an unnecessary burden on the United States Congress, and I believe it is time we trust it District of Columbia government to pass laws for its own citizens. H.R. 1045 would allow the district to forego congressional review and approval of its operating capital budgets financed from local revenues. The district budget moves through the routine federal appropriations process, which Congress regularly falls short of passing before the beginning of the fiscal year. In fact, only once since 1996 has Congress enacted the district's budget before the start of the district's fiscal year, allowing the district to implement its local budget without mandatory congressional review will prevent delay in service funding and, more important, service delivery. Citizens of the District of Columbia pay taxes, and the, <clears throat> the way those tax dollars are spent should be determined by their elected officials. The people of the District of Columbia deserve and demand the full rights that they are due. 
and I appreciate again Congresswoman Norton's tireless efforts to achieve this for them. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to hearing the testimony of the witnesses, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes for an opening statement. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Chairman Lynch, and thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, and I want to thank Congresswoman Norton for her leadership um, for, on the District of Columbia. And it's a pleasure uh, to uh, welcome this panel, especially my old friends, uh, Mayor Fenty and Chairman Gray, with whom I worked uh, many years in uh, local regional issues here in the National Capital Region. For the life of our Republic, we have relied on a Federalist system to deliver services in a cost-effective manner that protects individual civil rights and general welfare, except in Washington, D.C. Our founders established a system of government that constrained the power of the Federal Government and protected local and state prerogatives, except in Washington, D.C. For the last two centuries, we have witnessed the creative evolution of the roles of local, state and Federal governments, except in Washington, D.C., where the City Council's attempts to govern in accordance with its residents' needs and desires has been constrained and thwarted all too frequently by political game and gamesmanship and obstruction by this Congress. The District of Columbia faces many challenges. Uh, unfortunately, the District's residents' capacity to hold local officials accountable in addressing these challenges is compromised because those local officials are constrained by congressional attempts either to manipulate laws in the District and or congressional failure to approve District budgets in a timely manner. If the residents of the District are going to hold their elected officials accountable, Congress needs to get out of the way. Congresswoman Norton has presented us with two bills that would restore a Federalist balance of power to local government in the District of Columbia, the District Legislative Autonomy Act and the District of Columbia Budget Autonomy Act are two notable and worthy pieces of legislation. Some may be concerned these bills would result, uh, result in things like tighter gun controls or protection for certain people with certain lifestyles. Whether they do or not, I don't think, is the business of this Congress. Um, I believe that Congress needs to defend the underlying principle of local autonomy, even if the district contemplates actions with which we individually or even collectively may disagree. It's not our business. It simply should not be the role of Congress to meddle with local decision making. That is a principle I have always held, and it's a principle that will guide me in my future policy and votes with respect to this local government. I thank the Chair and yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, before we turn to uh, the testimony of our witnesses, I would like to offer some brief introductions of our first panel. Uh, the Honorable Adrian M. Fenty was elected to serve as the fifth mayor of the District of Columbia in November 2006. As mayor, Mr. Fenty has made high-quality public education for all and efficient and accountable government his administration's policy priorities. A native of Washington, a native Washingtonian, Mayor Fenty attended Oberlin College before earning a Juris Doctorate degree from Howard University Law School. After graduating from law school, Mayor Fenty went on to serve as a local ANC commissioner and later as the Ward 4 council member from 2001 to 2007. The Honorable Vincent C. Gray is the current chairman of the District of Columbia City Council. Also a native Washingtonian and a proud graduate of the District of Columbia public school system, Chairman Gray has developed a reputation as a champion of young people by helping them and their families gain access to critical social services. Prior to being elected to chair the city's legislative body, Chairman Gray represented the, city, the city's residents of Ward 7 on the City Council. Chairman Gray is also well known for his service as the first executive director of the Covenant House, Washington, an organization dedicated to serving homeless and at-risk youth. Dr. Natwar Gandhi serves as the Chief Financial Officer for the Government of the District of Columbia. In his position, Dr. Gandhi is responsible, responsible for the City's finances, including its approximately $7 billion in annual operating and capital funds. Dr. Gandhi was appointed to this position on June 7, 2000, and was reappointed by Mayor Fenty in January 2007. As the independent CFO, Dr. Gandhi manages more than 1,000 staff members in Tax and Revenue Administration and in the Treasury, Comptroller and Budget Offices of the District of Columbia. Ms. Alice Rivlin is served as the first director of the 
Congressional Budget Office and as the Chair of the District of Columbia Control Board. Ms. Rivlin is an expert on urban issues as well as on fiscal, monetary and social policy. Currently, she directs the Greater Washington Research Project as a Senior Economic Studies Fellow for the Brookings Institution. Mr. Walter Smith is the Executive Director of the D.C. Appleseed Center, a nonprofit public interest organization which addresses issues facing the nation's capital. Prior to his position with D.C. Appleseed, Mr. Smith was a partner for 16 years with the city's largest law firm, Hogan and Hartson. It is the committee's policy that all witnesses to appear before the committee and submit testimony shall be sworn. Could I ask you each to stand and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record show that all of the witnesses have answered in the affirmative and the entire, your entire written statements are entered into the record. I trust that you have been before this committee before, but just to go over the ground rules, those small boxes in front of you will uh, indicate uh, green, uh, which means that you have uh, time to submit your opening statement. When it turns to yellow, it means that uh, you should probably conclude your, your statement, and then red light means you have exceeded your time limit. So with that, uh, Mayor Fenty, it is an honor to have you here before this committee. I welcome you, and you are now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Chairman Lynch, uh, Ranking Member Chaffetz, uh, distinguished subcommittee members, including my own Congressman Norton, uh, Chairman Towns and others. It is my pleasure to be here today to speak to you about H.R. 1045, the District of Columbia Budget Autonomy Act of 2009, and H.R. 960, the District of Columbia Legislative Autonomy Act of 2009. Both bills if enacted, would represent an important step forward for the District of Columbia and its residents. To that end, I would like to take a moment to recognize the outstanding work of the District's representative in the House, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, who for years has championed the bills before this subcommittee today and many others designed to grant the District the autonomy it deserves. These bills simply provide the District the same flexibility and autonomy afforded other jurisdictions around the country. To ensure the efficient and effective delivery of services, a fundamental responsibility of good government. In 1973, Congress granted the district limited home rule powers and empowered the citizens of the district to elect a mayor and a city council. At the same time, however, Congress retained the power to review and approve all district laws, including the district's annual budget. This makes the district unique among jurisdictions that perform state-level functions. As the district goes, as the district does, in that Congress approves not only federal funding for the district, but also the spending of our local funds, a practice that ultimately hinders good government. The district government of today is not the district government of the 1990s which saw the creation of the congressionally mandated control board because of unsound financial practices. Thanks in part to the work of my predecessor, Mayor Anthony Williams, we have come a long way since then and we are not going back. This year the district submitted to Congress its 14th consecutive balanced budget and we continue to exercise sound financial management practices, a fact validated by the A-plus credit rating awarded to our bonds by the nation's rating agencies. I am confident Dr. Gandhi will speak to the significance of that in a few minutes, but I hope my point is clear. The district's fiscal house is in order, and the time has come to lessen the burdens imposed by congressional approval of the district's budget. Current law subjects the district's budget to the federal appropriations process which requires district agencies to plan their budgets almost a year in advance to allow for congressional approval. The approval process often causes unnecessary delays in service delivery and prevents the district 
from responding quickly to changing public needs. As a primary deliverer of services, local governments can only be effective if they can respond to changing circumstances in a timely and responsive manner. Unfortunately, Congress fails to approve the district's budget on time virtually every year, resulting in a near three-month delay on average, a period in which critical new investments cannot be made. The district also faces challenges over the course of the fiscal year as any mid-year adjustments caused by changes in revenue must be reviewed by Congress. Many of the issues I've raised regarding budget autonomy also apply to the issue of legislative autonomy. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution allows the House and Senate to examine every piece of legislation by the Council. Depending on the nature of the legislation, however, we must wait 30 or 60 legislative days for passive congressional approval before legislation becomes law. As I said in my testimony on this matter two years ago, this makes me the only chief executive of a city or state in this country for whom the act of signing legislation does not make the legislation final. It also means the Council of the District of Columbia passes hundreds of bills every year that must await congressional approval, the, ma the vast majority of which are of no interest to Congress whatsoever. The limited legislative autonomy granted by the bill proposed by Congresswoman Norton would maximize the use of taxpayer dollars, reduce inefficiencies caused by a complicated legislative process required to comply with federal law, and allow the district to realize a greater measure of self-government. I urge this Congress to take swift action on these two pieces of important legislation. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Gray, Chairman Gray, uh, you are now recognized for five minutes. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Lynch, and thank you to the uh, ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz, and to the other members who have uh, joined us today. I am uh, Vincent C. Gray, Chairman of the Council of the District of Columbia, and I want to thank you again, Chairman Lynch, for holding this uh, hearing on two important pieces of legislation. Uh, H.R. 1045, the District of Columbia Budget Autonomy Act of, 2000, of, 10, of uh, uh, 1009, and H.R. 960, the District of Columbia Legislative Auto Autonomy Act. I also want to thank my Congresswoman, Eleanor Holmes Norton, for introducing both of these bills on behalf of the District of Columbia. These two bills, along with the District of Columbia House uh, Voting Rights Act, uh, would provide the first real advancement of home rule in the district. Uh, which since the Congressional enactment of the Limit Home, Home Rule Act uh, over 30 years ago. The district uh, must develop its budget in a time frame that complies with the complicated and lengthy federal appropriations process, as has been stated. The federal appropriations process forces the district to develop its budget months in advance of the time frame needed by the city. In fact, the district has had to adopt the federal fiscal year of October 1 to September 30, when another fiscal year uh, may be more appropriate to the city. The Congressional appropriation schedule prevents the district from using uh, more current revenue estimates and expenditure needs that would lead to a budget based on better and more complete data. In the last several years, Congress has granted approval of the district's local budget by the beginning of the fiscal year without approving federal appropriations. But that timely approval is not guaranteed for every year. The approval of H.R. 1045 would provide the, the guarantee that guarantee by removing the approval of the district's local budget by the Congress. Under the proposed legislation, Congress would still maintain its constitutionally established oversight authority. Uh, half of our total budget is funded by local dollars generated within the District of Columbia. The local budget is funded by local district revenue, not federal dollars. The reason, this reason alone justifies why the district should be allowed to approve our own budget. I believe the district has earned the right to budget autonomy. We have come from under the authority of the Financial Control Board. We have maintained a strong financial position, including a fund balance of $1 billion. We have received clean audits for the last decade. Bond rating agencies have consistently increased our ratings. And we have strong internal financial controls. On the issue of legislative autonomy, after 35 years, the process for enacting laws in the district needs to be revised. This process once again denies district residents the basic right granted to, you, to other U.S. citizens, the right to enact our own local laws. What is even more interesting is the fact that four territories 
uh, have, allowed, have been allowed to enact their own laws without congressional review. The current process involves a review period of 30 legislative days for civil laws and 60 legislative days for criminal laws. Because the actual legislative days depend on when Congress is in session and not calendar days, enactment of many district laws is delayed well beyond the 30 or 60 days uh, involved. This prevents the City from enacting laws in a timely manner that are important to addressing the continuous and often changing needs of the City. An example of this was an enactment by the Council of updated terminology found in the D.C. Official Code changing the word handicap to disability. The Congressional review for this change was nine months. In order to address the needs of government, the Council must use a Byzantine process of passing laws on an emergency, temporary and permanent basis. A bill passed on an emergency basis is enacted for only 90 calendar days because many pieces of legislation passed by the Council do not complete their Congressional review during the emergency enactment period. The Council must also pass temporary laws that are in effect for 225 days following the end of the emergency enactment period. In addition, the Council must pass the permanent bill so that ultimately there is a final law that becomes part of the D.C. Code. In fact, in most of the years between 1997 and 2008, emergency and temporary bills have amounted to over two-thirds of the bills enacted by the Council. We have appended to, to our testimony a graphic example of that, which uh, hopefully you will take a look at. But just within the last Council period that ended in 2008, we had over 600 laws that were passed in the District of Columbia. 465 of those laws were emergency and temporary laws in order to be able to deal with the very difficult process that we face as a result of the uh, current uh, bit provisions under which we operate. Now is the time to grant the District the right to self-determination, budget autonomy, legislative autonomy, and the right to voting representation. I ask you, uh, Chairman Lynch and the other members of the subcommittee, to grant the district government the self-determination that all other governments in our country enjoy and move our residents more towards full citizenship in this nation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Oh, thank you, sir. Dr. Gandhi, you are now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Sheffitz, our own Congresswoman Norton, members of the committee, as you pointed out, I am Natvaram Gandhi, Chief Financial Officer for the District, and I'm here to testify today and wholeheartedly endorse expanding the authority of the District to manage its own financial affairs. Not only do I believe that the District's elected leadership has demonstrated its ability to adhere to principles of fiscal responsibility, I also believe that greater budget autonomy would provide the citizens of the district, as well as visitors with the highest quality of public services in a timely manner. The chart that appears before you, Mr. Chairman, is a history of the remarkable fiscal comeback achieved by the district over the past dozen years. Our fiscal low points occurred in 1996 when the general fund balance hit a negative of $518 million. Through the efforts of the elected leaders and the control board, we were able repeatedly to balance the district's fiscal operations and the, current board, and the control board was deactivated in 2001. Between 1996 and 2001, there was a $1 billion increase in the fund balance. But the real test for the district was the challenge of sustaining the fiscal stability in the post-control period. As you can see, at the end of 2005, the general fund balance rose another billion dollars to $1.6 billion, a turnaround of more than $2 billion. This improvement was reflected in the credit ratings assigned to the district by the major bond rating agencies. Our bond ratings, which, are, which were junk bonds in mid-90s, were upgraded to current A-plus category by all three rating agencies simultaneously. Indeed, the turnaround by the district was faster than any major city that experienced severe fiscal distress, including Philadelphia, Cleveland, Detroit, and New York. In addition, 
our income tax bonds issued for the first time in the March of this year were assigned a rating of triple A, the highest possible rating by Standard and Poor, and double A by Moody's and Fitch. I should note that the initial offering of $800 million of the income tax bonds was, has been nominated the deal of the year by the Bond Buyer magazine. This is a remarkable achievement for a city that was in fi dire financial straits only a dozen years ago. Let me note here that the district and nearly every other state and local government in the nation have been profoundly affected by financial problems because of the depth and duration of this recession. What will distinguish the district when we look back at this period is our absolute commitment to balancing our budget. Mayor Fenty, Chairman Gray, and the Council reacted quickly each time there was a revenue re-estimate to close the budget gaps that were created by lower forecast. I would now talk about the budget autonomy. Under the current law, all district spending is authorized by the Congress through the federal appropriation process, irrespective of the sources of the revenue. In the district 2010 proposed budget, gross budget of $8.8 .8 billion, about $6 billion, or 68%, comes from the revenues raised through local sources. Only $188 million in federal payments were specifically requested from federal sources. The balance is com comprised of formula-based federal grants which are available to all jurisdictions nationwide. I would argue that only the federal payments that are specifically and uniquely earmarked for the district should, should be appropriated by the Congress. If the District Council were able to set its own schedule to enact a budget, the mayor and the legislator could always be, rely upon a revenue estimate based on more current data. Currently, the budgets are based in large part on revenue estimates completed in February, some seven months before the start of the new fiscal year in October, and, to, and total of 20 months before the end of the fiscal year. The district does not get actual data on how accurate these revenue estimates are or, and whether budget expenditures are fully covered until after the end of the fiscal year, almost two years later than the budget estimates were provided to beginning. In summary, the district's leadership has the will and the necessary resources to make informed decision and district has proven record of functioning in a fiscally responsible manner. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my remarks. I would be delighted to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, sir. Ms. Revlin, you are now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. And thank you for holding this hearing. I am happy to be here to discuss greater autonomy for the District of Columbia. I strongly support both the bills before you, but I will confine my remarks to the budget autonomy. I believe that greater autonomy for the District of Columbia is a test of the seriousness of Congress's commitment to democracy. The United States is justifiably proud of our democratic tradition. We send our finest young men and women to faraway places to fight and die for democratic ideals. Our national leaders advocate democracy around the world. But right here at home, Congress apparently doubts that the citizens of the District of Columbia can be trusted to elect leaders who will make wise decisions about local policy, even about how to spend our own locally collected tax revenue. When Congress passed the Home Rule Act in 1973, it retained ultimate control over D.C. legislation, budgeting, and borrowing. At that time, congressional skepticism was understandable. The citizens of the district had been ruled like colonial subjects for a long time and had no experience with electoral politics or self-government. And the inexperience showed when the city faced fiscal crisis in 1995. But I be and I believe that the Congress, working with the Clinton administration, and, uh, took the necessary and appropriate action when it created the D.C. Financial Resources Management and Assistance Authority, that was its real name, uh, better known as the uh, Control Board. 
That same legislation created an independent office of the fi chief financial officer, a much needed contribution to strengthening fiscal oversight uh, in the district. As the CFO has said, control board actions supported by the City Council combined with an approving economy turned the district's budget outlook from dismal uh, to positive in a very short time. Young democracies learn from their mistakes, and the District of Columbia government has amply demonstrated in recent years that it learned from the experience of the 1990s and is able to manage its own resources responsibly. It has balanced its budget every year since the control period ended and earned cleaned audits, albeit with some expressions of concern from the audits from time to auditors from time to time. It has built up a large fund balance and significant cash reserves. Growing Wall Street respect for the district's financial management has been reflected in increasingly favorable ratings for its general obligation bonds and a AAA rating for its recent income tax uh, ba backed uh, bond issue, as the CFO uh, has, uh, has noted. Now is the time for Congress to show its commitment to democratic government by trusting the citizens of the District of Columbia through their elected officials to handle their own fiscal affairs without interference or delay from Congress. In fact, in recent years, Congress has interfered far less than it used to in districts' budgets and tried to accommodate the district's needs by keeping district appropriations from getting caught in lengthy disputes over federal spending bills that drag on long after the budget year has begun. This confidence is reassuring, but it should be reflected in law. If H.R. 1045, the District of Columbia Budget Autonomy uh, Act of, 19, of uh, 2009 were enacted, district officials could design their own process for coming to budget decisions. Once a budget reflecting spending out of its own revenues was passed by the Council and signed by the Mayor, it could not be altered by Congress or delayed by the Congressional Appropriations uh, process. Budget autonomy for the district is a win-win for the district and the federal government, as well as a demonstration of national confidence in the democratic process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you. Mr. Smith, welcome. You are now recognized for five minutes. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it is an honor for me to appear before this distinguished panel. It is also an honor for me to be a member of this distinguished panel this morning. Um, I am from D.C. Appleseed. We are a nonprofit organization that tries to address the issues facing citizens of the district. And one of the issues that has always faced citizens of the district was striving toward getting the same kind of full democracy that other citizens of this country have. These two bills are an important step in achieving that greater democracy. And, and the bill that I want to talk about is the legislative autonomy bill. It seems to me that that bill is the right thing to do for three reasons. First of all, it is a fair and sensible thing to do, and it is a practical thing to do. Second, it is completely consistent with what the Congress did in the Home Rule Act. And third, it is completely consistent with the district clause authority that, that, the, uh, that the Congress has and will retain if this bill is passed. What makes it such a practical thing to do is that the Congress has not used this layover authority once in almost 20 years. It's only used it three times since the Home Rule Act was passed. Congress has found other means and methods to review actions by the D.C. Council, and yet, as Chairman Gray pointed out, the Council has to continue to bombard you and members of your staff with pieces of legislation, the majority of them which are designed to address the fact that they have to have emergency bills and temporary bills to, to be a gap filler. In fact, the numbers are actually staggering. Since Home Rule, 4,400 4, pieces of legislation have been passed. They are sent to 11 different places up on the Hill, which means almost 48,000 pieces are coming up here. And as Mr. Cummings pointed out, these 
avalanche of documents are unnecessarily burdensome to the Congress. Presumably, members of Congress and their staff are looking at these pieces as they come up to no effect at all. And as the Home Rule Act itself said when passed, the purpose of the Home Rule Act was to grant to the inhabitants of the District of Columbia powers of local self-government and to relieve Congress of the burden of legislating upon essentially local district matters. This bill advances that very important purpose of the Home Rule Act. The other important point to make is that even if you remove the layover provision, you retain the full authority and responsibility under the District Clause to review and revise any legislation as you choose, as the Home Rule Act otherwise points out. But it's important to remember, and I urge upon you what the framers had in mind when they first adopted the District Clause. It was pr to protect the federal government's interest in the national capital. The purpose was not to entrust to the national legislature the burden and the responsibility of legislating upon local matters. And I would just urge upon you, if you ever want to read what the framers had in mind, it's contained in Federalist Number 43, which James Madison wrote. And let me just quote what I think is the most important part of that Federalist 43 for purposes of the Legislative Autonomy Bill before you today. He said, residents of the district, and I quote him now, this has to do with ceding land for purposes of founding a nation's capital. He said, residents of the nation's capital, quote, will find sufficient inducements of interest to become willing partners of the session because a municipal legislature for local purposes derived from their own suffrages will, of course, be allowed them. Mr. Madison was recognizing that the district clause was designed to protect federal interests, not to take away from the citizens who lived in what would become the nation's capital the right to have their own self-government and to decide local issues through their own municipal legislature. So I applaud Mrs. Norton and the supporters of this bill because this bill takes a step, a practical fair step, toward achieving what James Madison was talking about so long ago. Thank you. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Mayor Fenty, uh, Chairman Gray, I, I think you've all touched on uh, one, one common point, and that is that uh, <clears throat> there remain, and, and, and especially I think Dr. Gandhi in his, his remarks uh, spoke of the remaining safeguards uh, and, and the various mechanisms that the district has in place to ensure uh, proper financial management and integrity in, in the budget process. Uh, however, I, I do want to point out that uh, even absent the current protocol for congressional review, uh, many of the financial benchmarks that uh, Dr. Gandhi and others have referred to uh, derive directly from the District of Columbia Financial Responsibility and Management Assistance Act of 1995, uh, such, as, such as the reinstitution of a control board and there are other constraints in the event that the city might fail to meet its <coughs> financial obligations. Now, while I, while I raise that concern, I acknowledge, as the mayor has pointed out, 14 consecutive budgets uh, have been balanced and there's a, a, a substantial and admirable record of, of fiscal responsibility. But I, I'm just, I just want to be reassured here that uh, at least in my reading of uh, Ms. Holmes Norton's legislation, those checks and balances would remain in place. Those would continue to be uh, adhered to. Uh, and I just want to make sure we are on the same page. Is that, is that your understanding? Uh, yes, Chairman. And uh, I, I think it's important to note that uh, the people of the District of Columbia uh, really enthusiastically support the independent CFO, uh, as we also enthusiastically support uh, something else created by the control board, which are the fiscal impact statements. No bill passed 
uh, by the Council of the District of Columbia can move forward uh, even for my signature unless the CFO has authorized it, the dollars are there uh, to go along with the bill. So now there, there are a lot of local safeguards uh, that will still remain in addition to the uh, federal safeguards that uh, Mr. Smith just talked about. Right. Mr. Chairman? Uh, Chairman Lynch, that is the uh, understanding of the Council as well. And I think if you look at the, uh, the controls that exist, those that we have uh, added, uh, it's, it's really, I think, a picture of how a municipality uh, ought to be run uh, in this instance. For example, just to echo what the Mayor said and to build on that, the Council no longer permits a bill even to be reported out of a committee until we have a fiscal impact statement uh, from the CFO indicating that we have the financial wherewithal to be able to effectively implement uh, that legislation. There was a time when the Council <coughs> permitted a bill get, to get to second reading uh, before the fiscal impact statement had to be available, but we have eliminated that. Uh, and those are the kind of controls that we continue to put in place because we heartily respect uh, the past and uh, use that as an opportunity to continue to build on our controls. Uh, we, too, uh, strongly support the independent CFO, work very closely with them. And I think that was never more evident <clears throat> in the recent, uh, in, in, within the last year, when we had four instances uh, where there were revenue uh, estimates that were lower than the previous one, and we all worked, effect worked effectively together to create a balanced budget for the District of Columbia. Uh, probably in the neighborhood of six or seven hundred million dollars of revenue estimates. But again, at the end of the day, we had a balanced budget as a result of that. That's great. Dr. If, I, if I may comment on that, Mr. Chairman, I, I think both Mayor and, 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 and Chairman have pointed out it so well that the in institutions of the Chief Financial Offer, Officer, independent CFO, uh, has been very well placed now in the conduct of the government. It has been institutionalized and also the various features of the CFO, the independence, <coughs> the five-year balance budget, making sure that for a recurring, resource, recurring expenditure you have a recurring resource, all that have been properly implemented by the CFO and that a budget will not be forwarded to the Congress or even to the mayor and council unless <coughs> it is properly balanced and certified so by the Chief Financial Officer. I think the test of the, uh, the whole office and uh, of the CFO is in the practice. And in my 10 years as a CFO, most of those years were post control board. Uh, I have been extremely gratified by the, by the respect that the mayor and the chairman and the council have shown to the office of the CFO. Thank you. My, my time has expired. Uh, I now yield uh, five minutes to the ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz of Utah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. Our, our hope and interest is in what's the best interest of the District of Columbia and in the United States of America. And I think, I happen to believe that a good collaborative effort uh, is one that our framers had envisioned. And that as you make the case that the, the, the city is working so well and so financially prudent and it's got good uh, budget uh, stop gaps in place and, and checks and balances, I can only wish the federal government would have some of the, that same discipline before <laughs> it goes off and puts more and more, tr literally trillions of dollars on our kids' future on, on just the credit card. So I, I wish we had some of the financial controls and discipline that are obviously implemented at the city. Um, uh, Chairman, let me ask you first. You, you said in your testimony that, uh, and I quote, district has clearly demonstrated that we have earned the right to budget autonomy, end quote. And you obviously are making the case that everything's going uh, uh, so well. Um, at the same time, you also say that, uh, I quote, all other state governments in our nation have this flexibility. My concern is that the District of Columbia is not a state. It's not a state. And it is, it is uh, dealt with differently. And I, just, I guess I take issue with that characterization of other states. And, and perhaps that's just a, a small typo. But for those of us that uh, are, are concerned about that, I, I, I truly am concerned about that. Um, if, if things are going so well, um, what sort of grade would you give the mayor? 
Well, the legislation is not about the Mayor's performance, but obviously we work well with the Mayor. Uh, we have worked through, over the last three years, we have worked well to try to create a balanced budget. And I think the evidence is in the audits, the evidence is in the fund balance that you see portrayed uh, over there. Um, it is evident in how this jurisdiction has been run. Um, I, I think and the and I, I appreciate it. I have such little time. I appreciate it. I guess what I, I was hoping and I and I did hear is the spirit of cooperation. That's because exactly that, right. And, and collaboration. And that same sort of cooperation I think can happen between the city and the Congress. And one of the statistics that jumps out along the way is how how infrequently the Congress actually does inject itself into some very uh, volatile volatile issues. But I do think it is that sort of check and balance within the constitutional framework that is important to us going going forward. Mayor, if I can if I can go to you because again my time is is so short. Uh, I want to talk for just a moment if I could about. Uh, the uh, uh, Opportunity Scholarship Program. Do you support the reauthorization of the Opportunity Scholarship Program in the District of Columbia, including entry for new students? As, con Sorry. As contained in the three-sector approach, uh, which has been a, uh, a part of uh, uh, the uh, submission from the President and both the, the past administration and the current, yes. Um, I need to jump uh, quickly. Uh, taking that same kind of concept of autonomy, you know, one of the issues that is, has come up is about uh, the same-sex marriage law. Are you, uh, as you are here supporting greater autonomy for the District of Columbia, would you extend that principle to the local voters in the form of a referendum on same-sex marriage law, as has been done in 31 states? Uh, short answer is no. Uh, longer answer is I believe the people of the District of Columbia have elected a fabulous council of the District of Columbia. Uh, who uh, has uh, uh, all the tools necessary uh, to make the type of decisions on what laws should and should not be passed. Chairman, did you want to address uh, <clears throat> My answer is no as well, uh, Congressman Chaffetz. Uh, we were elected to represent the people. I think the Council of the District of Columbia has done that extremely well. Uh, we tackle very difficult issues every day. Uh, when you look at school governance, that certainly was an issue uh, around well, I, which I want to I want to stick to the to, to, to well, just I'm, this I'm trying issue. to give you an example of how we have decided issues as a council uh, that I think are analogous to this school governance, building a base. My, my we, apologies. We represent my, the people. My, my time is, is so short. I'm disappointed that the people are not given an opportunity to vote on this issue. And if there's confidence in the council and others that this would pass, then allow the vote. But I think you see, we've seen in 31 states, again, different than the District of Columbia, it has passed 31 times in a row in opposition of, of the same sex marriage. Uh, last question. The, the, the administration is uh, pushing to take over, uh, at least there is a suggestion, they should take over the safety components uh, dealing with uh, mass transit, for a specific like the metro and whatnot. What is your reaction to that? Is that? Should that be something of great autonomy to the city? And, and I recognize that it goes into other states and whatnot. But is the administration moving in the right direction or is it? From what I understand, the administration is looking at it uh, on a national level. I, I haven't uh, uh, d done the proper level of in inquiry. Uh, once we do, we would be glad to present you with the full views of the local government. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Chairman now recognizes the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me quickly ask Mr. Gandhi. Um, um, for years, Mr. Gandhi, I believe you said you noted this, of course, is a recession year, that the district had what I recall was the greatest surplus in the United States. Was that the case? It's surplus, uh, which right. of course it's now having to use because of the recession. But uh, is it not the case that for uh, many years the district surplus outranked that of any state in the union or any city? We, we, were, we were among the uh, states, or I should say cities, uh, that have enjoyed substantial surpluses. Uh, Ms. Norton, I was in Chicago just uh, two weeks ago meeting with the chief financial officers of other cities, such as Chicago, uh, Los Angeles, New Orleans, uh, Denver, et cetera. Of all those places, our city, has done extraordinarily well, com relatively, comparatively, uh, in terms of our ability to enjoy 
the surpluses, and that is a great credit to the well, mayor. Well, the notion that the district would and did pile surpluses, didn't spend it up, and has fared better than many cities during this recession uh, is a source of pride to the city and a pride in the work that all of you have done. Uh, uh, Chairman Gray, uh, I know this is a ballpark number, but given how you have testified you have to jump through hoops just to get legislation to be into effect until we say it's okay or take no action. How much of your time, what, what ballpark uh, figure of your time is spent on, on uh, passing redundant laws or seeing that laws don't go out of effect while you're waiting for the Congress layoff, layover period to recede? Probably, <clears throat> probably, Mrs. Norton, in excess of 50 percent. Uh, again, in excess when you look of, at, of the time. Of 50 percent, did you say? Yeah, we, we have passed, as I indicated in my testimony, we have two thirds of the laws that we have passed since 1997 uh, in the Council have been laws that deal with emergencies and temporaries, all of which is an artifact of the system that we operate under. There is no question that some of those emergencies would have to be adopted in any event because of the an exigent need. However, when you ferret out those that are associated with uh, the process that we have to operate under here with the Congress, all the temporaries are associated with this process. So it is probably looking at two-thirds of the legislation being in that category, pulling out the legitimate emergencies that exist within the city, it is probably 50 percent of our legislative so time. Here, here we have, Mr. Half of the Council's time is spent redundantly when it is a big, complicated city, when it needs to get to the business of the, and it does so very well. But, but I think it makes the point about inefficiency. My last question really goes to a point that is seldom mentioned, but it is really a cardinal uh, point in all of this. And, and I mentioned it in passing, the June 30th fiscal year. And I'd like the comments of the panel on this, particularly in light. Perhaps I'll use an example. Uh, Mayor Fenty has uh, done something very important in the District of Columbia, with the cooperation of Chairman Gray, who deserves a lot of credit for hurting the whole council, to do what almost what very few states and cities have done, to say, uh, Mayor Fenty, you're in charge of the schools of the District of Columbia. So they have given him everything except uh, the ability to make sure schools have the same efficient start time. And of course, he started them on time as, as every other uh, jurisdiction. Our neighbors in Virginia, uh, for example, ready to go July 1st uh, unless something untold uh, happens. I would like you to describe using the schools perhaps as an example, or perhaps you have other examples. This is for anyone in the panel. Um, Mr. Smith is a former corporation counsel. We now call it Attorney General. Uh, 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 Ms. Rivlin and Mr. Gandhi are equally familiar with this. But I would like to know what difference it would make, because this bill would mean, for example, that you could decide, of course you might decide whatever, but you could decide that instead of September the 30th, when school has already started, is the beginning of your, your fiscal year that, for example, like most states, June 30th could be the, the uh, or July 1st could be the beginning of your fiscal year. And I would like you to describe what that would mean as far as all of you are concerned. Well, two quick things, Congressman. Uh, this year, uh, when the, after the budget was passed, uh, just because of the revenue forecast, the, the school system already uh, was looking at uh, less revenue of about $20 million going into uh, the new school year. Uh, if you are closer, if the budget pro uh, projections are closer to the time it is passed, you are not going to have that type of deficit. On a global perspective, uh, we have already had, I think, two or three meetings with all of our Cabinet heads, uh, and it is only November, in preparation for the budget that won't be passed uh, and ready until next October 1. So we are almost meeting to prepare for the next year's budget before the current year budget is even passed. Chairman well, Gray. I, I think for the Council, this, I think the schools, uh, the public schools, public education is an excellent example because what we have now is a situation in which um, the, the uh, planning for a particular school year spans two fiscal years. We have part of that budget uh, that begins, this, the latter part, if you will, of the, of the current year, for example, uh, spans the period from August until the end of September. 
and then we have the other part of the school year in the next fiscal year. It makes for very difficult planning and, and the schools again are an excellent example. If we could change the fiscal year to July 1, the entire school year would be included in one fiscal year. If I were to echo that uh, comment, I would agree about the schools and further, uh, the fundamental problem that we face here is that we provide revenue estimate to mayor and the council in February. The budget is submitted to the uh, Hill in June. The Congress doesn't act until October 1st in terms of its continuation resolution if, if there were no agreement. So there's a long delay between when we provide revenue estimate and when the budget is enacted. And the local government, we do not have a chance to adjust, readjust our budgeting in light of changing financial condition. I have very little to add to this uh, except to stress that the, all agencies are inconvenienced by this long delay, uh, but it is the schools and uh, DCPS and the charter schools and the university that have to get started uh, without knowing exactly what the budget is going to be. The only thing I would add, Mrs. Norton, is that having tried to run a district agency when I was at Corporation Council's office, not knowing what you can do and how much you can spend and when puts significant limitations on, on efficiency within the district. Okay. Thank you. Gentlelady's time has expired. You know myself just 30 seconds. Uh, my own experience with budgeting is uh, your revenue projections drive your budget. And what, what you are being forced to do is to come up with a budget prior to getting your revenue projections. And you've got a considerable amount of time here, lag time, where over the course of time those projections that you do have can be completely uh, destroyed by, by the passage of time. So there's just a couple of things going on there that uh, put you at a severe disadvantage, and I, I understand it. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from... I am sorry. I did not see Mr. Bill Bray come in. Uh, recognize Mr. Bill Bray, the gentleman from California, for five minutes. Welcome. I want to be treated like this, I can go home, Mr. Chairman. The, um, first of all, uh, let me clarify, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. President, I come from a background of, I was a mayor in, the 20, in my 20s in a young, small, little working class community on the border in California, but I also served as, uh, like the, the, the gentleman from Virginia, as the chairman of a county of three million. Um, and I just got to be, this is my chance to say something about this. I was absolutely appalled when I came here in the 90s um, and saw what appeared to be um, the gross abuses of local control by the local community. Um, freeways that were not allowed to go through because of ward politics. You know, I, I just, for that, maybe it's because I'm a California, I can't comprehend the ability of, of politics stopping a freeway dead in its tracks. Um, not just once, but twice, uh, though I've seen it happen. Um, the other thing I just got to tell you is uh, the fact is, Mr. Smith, this district was created for a special reason. Um, this little area between the Anacostia and the Potomac called Turkey Buzzard Point was chosen to be a no man's land from, from the political influences from the outside or from within for the federal, uh, much like we do with our military reservations too. But when I see the effect of the lack of appropriate control of the jurisdiction where I have staffers who resign and go home because they've been attacked, they've been threatened, they've almost been murdered, this, you know, the, the conditions on the streets, I think that I am constantly reminded as a former local government official that the Constitution does give us the ability to authorize jurisdiction um, but not responsibility. Constitution still re lays that right in our lap. A con this is one of those things that Congress can't say, it's not my jurisdiction. And the big difference is the same Constitution that gives states that jurisdiction and the states, the states are the ones who give cities their local control, not the, not the Constitution. The Constitution does not take away that local control from um, other cities. It did in this one, in this city. And so there is an issue here of the appropriateness of authorizing jurisdiction, but thinking we can walk away from the ultimate responsibility of young ladies being attacked and um, roads not being completed and the congestion and everything else that's our responsibility. I, I'd just like to ask down the line, Mr. Gandhi, you seem to appear 
who have done great things working with the local government when it comes to the budget process. And I want to give credit on that. After all of that trashing, I want to say you guys have come a long way in a lot of ways. I still don't understand why you put traffic lights in traffic circles. It violates every engineer, traffic engineering thing I learned, but that's a different issue. Why would we walk away from a successful program? As it, are we so sure that, don't worry, we will never go back to where we were? Your success is something I think we should build on and not abandon. Uh, sir, uh, I would give great credit to the mayor uh, and the chairman and the council. They are elected leaders and they do heavy lifting. Of course, there is an institution of an independent chief financial officer, and all these uh, good ideas have been built into that. But at the end of the day, it's the elected leaders who deserve a great deal of credit. And I think all we are talking about, and all I'm going to comment about, is the budget autonomy. That will make things easier for them, for me, and for the district's citizens. So I, I think we want to keep that in proper perspective, sir. Okay. And, Mayor, I understand the, the culture of politics and, in Washington that you inherited. Um, what I feel is undue influence of public employees being a basically government existing for the employees, not for serving the public and everything else. And I appreciate you've made some big changes there. But the concept um, as a Californian of not allowing voters to vote specifically on very controversial issues is something that, as a Californian, we don't accept. We, we specifically uh, um, allow overriding of legislative intent. Um, how do I go back and say to my constituents that as the state legislature of the city, let's just say it that way, I deny them the constitutional rights that we have in California, and that's the direct um, publicite on these very controversial issues. Well, you know, California is very unique uh, when it comes to the uh, referendum uh, process. Um, I think what you can say is that the uh, people of the District of Columbia, you know, just like uh, uh, the other 50 independent jurisdictions in this country, uh, have a different set of laws. And uh, our laws uh, have been made for some time and they work a certain way. If you look into our referendum and, and initiative process, I think there's ample opportunity for citizens to actually take things to the ballot. Uh, there's also just as much opportunity for the Council of the District of Columbia to pass laws. I think it works. It's a very healthy balance, in my opinion. That doesn't mean that uh, what happens in California or any other jurisdiction uh, isn't healthy as well. It's up to the particular state. Let me just say one other thing. Uh, I think, you know, this is a very narrow law, as Dr. Gandhi just said. Uh, what we think we have proposed in supporting Congressman, law, Congressman Norton's law is that all of the fiscal restraints, fiscal safeguards, both locally and federally, will be protected. But by passing this law, what you allow is uh, my administration and successive administrations to run the government better, but to maintain all of the federal and local fiscal restraints that currently exist. Well, I appreciate that. And I'm just in closing, I appreciate the fact that the district is defending a Republican form of government as opposed to a Democratic initiative process. And that constitutionality um, was a big issue in California about the fact that the Constitution does defend the Republican form of government I, I, as opposed to the Democratic direct um, uh, governance. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, uh, Mr. Kus okay, all right. We will go directly to Mr. Conley, the gentleman from Virginia, for five minutes. Thank you. I thank the chairman and I thank my colleague from Ohio for yielding. Um, by the way, I, I, I appreciate what my friend from California said, but it's a very arguable point how well recall referendum and initiatives have worked in California. Uh, one, wants to read a, uh, one wants to read a cogent critique of that. David Broder of the Washington Post wrote a book a few years ago that really lays out how, the influ how special interest influence has essentially co-opted what was once seen as a reform uh, at the turn of the 20th century. So there is another side to that. Um, Mr. Smith, you're, you're an attorney. You're familiar with the provision in the United States Constitution granting Congress in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, exclusive legislation in, in all cases whatsoever pertaining to the District of Columbia. I am, yes. Um, when that provision was written in 1787, how many people 
lived in the District of Columbia? Very few. When, in 1800, when the President of the United States, John Adams, uh, was the first occupant to move into the White House, do you know how many people lived in the District of Columbia? It was still very few. When the writers of the U.S. Constitution wrote this provision, do you believe that they, is there any evidence that they envisioned that the District of Columbia would eventually evolve into a vibrant metropolis with hundreds of thousands of residents? They were a prescient group, but I doubt if they saw all of that, Mr. Congressman. Anybody else on the panel want to take a stab at that one? Uh, well, given that fact, is there any other city you can think of, Chairman Gray, where Congress exercises, interprets this, and exercises the kind of oversight and control we do uh, in the District of Columbia. For example, is there any other city in the United States where we condition voting representation to the competence of the local government? I'm not aware of any, Congressman. Any city you can think of, uh, or county for that matter, where we condition voting representation here in the United States Congress on the quality and performance of the school system? Not to my knowledge. Any city or county in the United States you can think of that, uh, again, we condition voting representation here in the United States Congress based on how high or low the crime rate might be? Not to my knowledge. Dysfunctionality or functionality of uh, various municipal agencies? No. Hmm. Mm, ability to balance a budget? No. Really? Now, I'd be interested in your thoughts and yours, uh, Mayor Fenty. What then would be the logic of this Congress um, using this clause in the Constitution, which clearly was intended for a federal enclave that was temp you know, met periodically during the year and then pretty much shut down? It was never envisioned that uh, D.C. would become the city with hundreds of thousands of citizens and be denied the franchise, at least not as I read the Constitution, or the history of the writing of the Constitution. But uh, what is your view about the exercise of this provision and our oversight responsibilities and our conditionality of voting representation in the Congress based well, on that? I think, it's, I think it's clear to us that we have 600,000 people who live in the District of Columbia who are disenfranchised. Uh, we worked hard to try to, to get a vote for our representative in this Congress, Mrs. Norton. Uh, this issue around budget autonomy and legislative autonomy, I think, uh, echo uh, the point. We pay federal taxes just like everyone else. Uh, we pay three and a half, three point six billion dollars a year. Our sons and daughters and our family members go off to fight wars like uh, everyone else. Uh, we do the same things that other citizens of the United States do, yet we don't enjoy uh, the same rights, and that is the right of self-determination. And frankly, being able to make decisions about our budget, being able to make decisions about our legislation, especially to move this city forward in a timely fashion, are part of full citizenship uh, in this nation. And some, some frankly, we hadn't, if we hadn't crafted an emergency and temporary legislative process, we would have had experiences in the District of Columbia that would have slowed down the ability to make decisions, which frankly probably would have been criticized by this Congress and others because of our inability to move, yet it's the process that we have been required to operate under that would have delayed those decisions that needed to be made, decisions that we know what they needed to be, uh, Mr. Conley. And, and, and inability, if I can interject, created or generated by Congress because of our dithering over our oversight responsibilities. Is that correct? You said it very well. Mr. Chairman, I know my time is up, but I, as a courtesy, I want to get, if you wouldn't object, the mayor, the opportunity to comment similarly. Well, again, just to sum up, uh, Congressman, uh, you know, I think there are people who would uh, uh, take your view that the uh, no taxation without representation clause of the Constitution uh, is is the one that needs to uh, uh, be paid more attention to and uh, used to give, give us our full voting rights and representation. Uh, th those are issues uh, for uh, probably a broader in de debate in a different day. Uh, today, in focusing on the clause uh, that gives Congress uh, jurisdiction over the District of Columbia, it seems that the law that has been crafted by Congresswoman Norton uh, both gives the local officials the ability uh, to spend our dollars more wisely and efficiently, 
but doesn't uh, abridge that particular clause. So it seems like which you rarely get in, uh, in, in legislatures, having served on one for six years, a win-win. I thank you, and I thank the Chair. I thank the gentleman. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinic, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome the witnesses. I uh, speak in support of my colleague, uh, Mrs. Uh, Holmes Norton, for her commitment to uh, equality in the District of Columbia. You know, in some ways it seems like this discussion it's almost surreal that we can have <coughs> a city in America that's still struggling for self-determination while, as uh, Ms. Rivlin stated in her testimony, we want to export democracy all over the world. Really, I mean, something about this really doesn't compute. We understand what the Constitution says, and you know, Ms. Holmes Norton has come up with, I think, a, a reasonable approach that would modify the, uh, the cumbersome congressional oversight and review process. It's a very reasonable approach that you've taken, uh, Ms. Holmes Norton, and I think that uh, the Congress certainly should be supportive of that. Uh, but when you look at it in a broader context, it's really ridiculous that the District of Columbia doesn't have true autonomy. Is someone afraid they're going to take over the United States of America? I mean, it almost seems like a riff on uh, Leonard Wiberly's The Mouse That Roared. <laughs> Declare war on the United States and be pacified and wealthy beyond your wildest dreams. I don't think that's going to be what the District of Columbia is about as it moves towards greater autonomy. And so, uh, but we need to, as my uh, colleague Mr. Connolly has suggested, look at the historical context here. Uh, and look at our, the context of our Constitution. I mean, if there was ever a, a call for changing the Constitution and updating it, it's our relationship with the District of Columbia. We show a capacity for evolution in this nation. There was a time when people who, owned, uh, who didn't own property couldn't vote, a time when women couldn't vote, a time when people of color couldn't vote, a time when people under 21 couldn't vote. America's seen this capacity for evolution. So we changed the Constitution. Each time we understood. But because of the popular support for those uh, changes, uh, it was a little bit easier. DC is here as an advocate on behalf of the people in the district. We need to help people all over America understand that this is truly and should be a concern of all Americans. We shouldn't take out of our understanding the potential to change the Constitution in this regard. And while Ms. Holmes Norton uh, certainly has, uh, uh, has been peerless in her advocacy of, of equality for the District of Columbia, it's important for, uh, for, for your colleagues, Ms. Holmes Norton, to be heard from and to support your efforts in the, in the, in the boldest way possible. Because this, this really is a, a fundamental question of whether you have the right to, for self-governance. You know, as, as, a, uh, as a former mayor, I understand how important it is to be able to make decisions without uh, having other people continue to try to recut your decisions. The, 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 the essence of home rule in our city in Cleveland, home rule is moderate, modeled after the federal plan of government with the mayor being the chief executive and three branches of government, you know, with, with council and Cleveland being a co-equal branch of government, but the mayor is the chief executive. That's a way to make government work for people. Well, one correction I want to add to what Ms. Rivlin said. You know, Cleveland's financial crisis in 1978 was a manufactured one where the banks tried to dictate to the city the sale of a municipal electric system as a precondition for the city getting credit. And I mention that because that's a home rule issue too, whether the city had the right to make its own decision to keep an electric system without banks saying, look, you better get rid of that system or we're going to force uh, or not give you credit. So the principle of home rule is joined to uh, democratic theory. It's joined to 
the spirit and the letter of our Constitution. And just because our Constitution has not yet, we haven't worked out that, uh, that one provision, uh, doesn't mean we can't find a way, with the wisdom of uh, Ms. Holmes Norton, to, to adapt to where we are right now, give the district some additional flexibility, and then at the same time, work with those of like mind who see that we really need to change the Constitution to make uh, the District of Columbia uh, a place that people can truly uh, call uh, their own through uh, being able to have direct election of officials at every level. So I thank you, uh, uh, Mayor Fenty, for the work that you do and all members of the panel for their um, forthright presentation of the needs of the people of the district. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, let me just ask, uh, and I don't know if everybody's got more questions, but I, I just have one. And there is a certain aspect of this that uh, Congress has a constitutional responsibility. We're not suggesting ab abdicating that responsibility. What we're suggesting here, I think, is that in many cases, Congress delegates the authority that's given to us through the Constitution. And the question here that we're grappling with it and with with which uh, Ms. Ellen Holmes Norton has, has grappled most intently is that uh, the way in which we delegate that responsibility has a whole lot to do with how efficiently that authority is implemented. And we've done it in a way, I think, uh, so far. Uh, it was improved upon back in 73 with the home rule piece, but I think there are still some encumbrances on, on the city government in trying to do the job that we, we hope you would do. And uh, it's most clearly illustrated, I think, in the, the budget process where uh, we ask you to, to comply with a, a, a budget requirement in a way that's virtually impossible. So I, I certainly understand the budgetary autonomy piece of this uh, uh, and, and how that, that could be worked out. I can envision a solution there. Uh, the one reservation I have is over issues that are uh, inherently uh, driven by Congress's presence here in, in, the, in the Capitol, and that is the security of the district because of what we bring. Uh, we, we made you a target on 9-11, on, on but for the fact that Congress and the seat of our national government is here, uh, you would not have been a target. So. Uh, there's, there's a heightened level of security that's necessary because Congress is present here. And I think that uh, we need to make sure that that job gets done in, in a very businesslike and, uh, and uh, appropriate fashion. We, we have great reservations, I, I should say, uh, on behalf of Congress about delegating that authority to the degree that we don't have immediate uh, responsibility and, and control. Uh, the other piece is obviously I, I think up to 40 percent of the, of the real property in the district is controlled by the federal government uh, as part of our uh, ability to do our jobs that are federal. Again, for that 40 percent of the property that's covered by the federal government, we need to have that same type of uh, immediate uh, impact on, on Congress's decisions. Outside of those two very real and different and immediate needs, uh, how, Mayor, how do, how do you think we can work this out in terms of uh, giving you that flexibility that you need, but keeping close uh, for Congress our ability to impact those things that are inherently federal uh, in, in conducting our day-to-day -day business? Great question, Chairman. I, from the way I read the legislation, I do not see how uh, the laws that are already passed uh, in the Council's normal course of business um, and which I think has been put on the record uh, are, are go through and almost 100 percent approval through the U.S. Congress would be changed, would change anything about the relationship between the federal government and the local government, uh, especially when the, uh, it doesn't change the district clause, 
uh, which gives uh, Congress uh, the power to uh, come back in at any point and uh, make a statement uh, uh, about uh, about a particular or particular budget that we pass. It is really just about the operations and efficiency of government. I would put on the record uh, that one day we will have that we will have the bigger discussion about whether the District of Columbia gets full sovereignty and what you do with the individual with the, with the more federal parts of the government. But I don't think this legislation gets anywhere close to that uh, since it uh, merely just talks about uh, the process uh, and the time by which our laws uh, become final. And I would say that both in the past administration uh, and, and in the current one, uh, whether it is an inauguration, whether or not it is uh, the uh, many var varied and myriad uh, threats that do come uh, upon the city that we all call home, uh, there is unbelievable cooperation uh, between our first responders uh, and uh, the Homeland Security Agencies uh, and, uh, and, and federal law enforcement that you all uh, have uh, the uh, privilege of overseeing their budget. Uh, no matter what our structure, uh, and certainly with the passage of this law, uh, there, was ha there has to be good management and uh, the city is well prepared and I think the federal government is as well to continue that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you want to comment on that? Or? Well, just, just to echo what has been uh, a theme throughout this uh, hearing, uh, and that is there is nothing about this legislation that changes uh, Article 1, Section 8, and that continues to vest in uh, this Congress the authority uh, to intervene where it may consider it appropriate to intervene. It simply gives us the ability to more flexibly and rapidly manage our affairs uh, in the District of Columbia, especially around the passage of legislation, especially around uh, the issue uh, of budget. In my testimony, I cited an example, and I chose it in particular, that it took nine months for the District of Columbia to be able to change the term handicap to disability in our laws because of the requirement for congressional uh, review. I can't imagine that anybody in the Congress would, first of all, object to such a change because it is far more dignified, or even more importantly, why would the Congress want to be involved in that kind of change uh, at the local level uh, in the District of Columbia? And I go back also, Mr. Chairman, to the, uh, the reality that in 35 years we have had these disapproval resolutions used three times, the last time 19 years ago, which I think is a prima facie case for the ability of this city, one, to manage itself, uh, especially through difficult times, and secondly, the collaborative relationship that we have crafted with this Congress. I thank you. Uh, Chair, I will recognize the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz, for five minutes. Thank you. And I, I, again, I appreciate everybody and their, their dialogue. I think this is a healthy part of the process. I would hate to think that you would like to come here less often. <laughs> um, I, I do believe that the District of Columbia holds a special place in the hearts and minds of all the American people. There is only one capital of the United States of America. And our Constitution recognizes that. And, and I, I think the, the gentleman from Ohio, a good friend, uh, brings up a, an important point that if there is a discussion or an effort to change the Constitution, perhaps that is a separate discussion. Uh, I happen to disagree with it. I think that it is uh, divinely inspired. and I, I think it says literally what it means. Um, but as he brought up at the end of his comments an effort to perhaps change the Constitution, well, maybe we ought to have that discussion. It is certainly his right and prerogative to bring that up. I would, I would oppose that uh, just at first blush. Uh, but until it is changed, I, I have a hard time with the direction that these two pieces of legislation go. And I have the greatest respect for what you do and how you do it and, and, and what uh, uh, the representative brings to the table and her perspective. Uh, nothing but the utmost respect. But at the same time, those of us that believe wholeheartedly in the Constitution, literally as it says, I don't think is in, in direct opposition or shouldn't be met with um, the vehemence that you sometimes get uh, in, in standing tall on the Constitution. Um, I would also take exception with the characterization that the budget process is some impossible um, uh, feat given that chart that you are so willingly able to put up there. In fact, as I look back over the history, and I am still studying it and starting and, and continuing to understand it, it was actually an enactment of Congress that created the independent uh, 
uh, a CFO uh, position that helped change the direction and, and consequently created a positive result. At the same time, there have been a host of challenges. There have been a number of things where maybe the changing of the word is something that just innocuous and we just, you know, we don't need to deal with that. But I do believe that there is a role and responsibility for Congress to help make that determination because there have been very uh, contentious subjects such as needle exchange and, and uh, the Second Amendment issues and the Hyde Amendment and, and budget scandals and all sorts of things that have happened. You could argue that those would happen in other cities too, but this is the unique um, provision set up by our founders in our Constitution. And um, I, I don't know if you, you would like to address that. It's not a direct question, but it's just an approach. And, and Mayor, I'll give you the first stab at this, but that's kind of where we're coming from, or at least where I'm coming from. And um, I want to applaud you for the success you had, but I want to hold your feet to the fire for the things that aren't going well. And that system of checks and balances and accountability and having to come up here to the Hill is a very healthy process. And yes, it's different than every other city in the United States of America. That's okay. That's good. That's the way our framers set it up. Well, I think in any legislative debate, there, become, there comes a point where you agree to disagree. I actually don't think we're at that point in, with this bill. I, I think that you know, if you are a member of Congress and you have a particular uh, personal position uh, that is different than what has been voted out by the Council of the District of Columbia, after the passage of these two bills, it seems like you still have a vehicle to make your, uh, your personal opinion known uh, and to introduce some type of amendment. I think what this bill speaks to is more the, the, the running of the government, which I think the, the case has been put there just by the sheer numbers of bills that come through you that, that don't uh, raise any uh, concerns for you, that having those go through an additional six to nine months uh, is it does cost the District of Columbia time, energy, and resources. Could we manage our affairs otherwise? Sure, we're not going to uh, uh, say we, we can't, but could we manage them better if the law were passed? Uh, I, I think we've put a good case before you that we could. And Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. I appreciate those comments. I still think we have the very best form of, of government, and I think that check and balance, as expensive as it may be in dollars, in time is a worthwhile process. And with that, I yield back my overtime. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank the gentleman. I want to recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay, for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Could Thank I ask you the gentleman to yield? The hearing. Could I ask my good Excuse friend, me. the gentleman uh, from Missouri, if he would yield for a moment? I'm doing the Senate to 12 o'clock. For a moment. Oh, sure. Yeah, I don't want to ask a question. I just want to say for the record, uh, uh, because of Mr. Chavis's concern that. Uh, uh, even with needle exchange, which has cost lives and, and serious illness in the District of Columbia, the, all the plenary power of the district, uh, sorry, of the Congress would remain uh, to interfere with or, in your view, correct what the district is, is doing. And the proof of that is this Congress has already delegated partial home rule, uh, home rule on everything but budget and legislation, finality, so just do what you already have done in 1974. The only, uh, it seems to me, real concern has been raised by the chairman. Is there any interference with the national government's concern? That is a legitimate concern, Mr. Chairman, of the, the three times in which the district laws have used the, uh, plen the <laughs> disapproval resolution. Uh, two of the three had to do with mistakes by the district. It had passed laws that interfered with the federal presence. Um, the budget and legislative autonomy bills before us deal with local laws having nothing whatsoever to do with, the nat with national concerns. Even so, even so, you could intervene to overturn any of those laws. It, the only difference is the inconvenience of having us wait for months for our budget, months for our bills, uh, would would no longer be there. You'd have to move uh, a bit more, 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 more quickly. 
um, the federal, the, the chairman mentioned property in the District of Columbia, the federal property. This property remains the sole jurisdiction and under the under sole control uh, of, of the government. And finally, as a member of the Homeland Security Committee, the chairman has raised an important point. What about the security of the nation's capital? For 10 years, we have operated, almost 10 years now since 9-11, uh, under a regime of partnership with the federal government to protect the security of the uh, nation's capital. The truth is, Mr. Chairman, that they can't do it without, without our police force uh, and without our resources. So they are joined at the hip when it comes to uh, homeland security. Um, and let us remember federal supremacy. Even the D.C. National Guard is not controlled by the mayor as in other states. The D.C. National Guard is under the direct control already and always federalized of the federal government. So Congress has taken care of its own security. And should there be uh, any problem under its plenary, plenary authority, it could simply take over the whole city for security reasons. So thank you for raising that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. I think the gentlelady. Mr. Mayor, I know you had a time constraint, and I, I don't want to delay you any further, but I am, so if you need to uh, scoot, you can. I, I thank you very much for your, uh, the time. Mr. Chairman. Wait a minute, Mr. Yep. Chairman, I did I, have I, some. No, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not, and it's just okay. the mayor had, had, a, had a conflict, and I'm just giving him the courtesy of uh, departing if he has to. And I recognize the gentleman from California. I, I, and I would, I would just like to give the, the mayor the chance to clarify, because I don't think he wants to leave here leaving the impression of a statement he made. And I think you misspoke, and you don't want to read about it later. You, you made a reference to uh, no taxation without representation being in the Constitution. You want to clarify that you did not mean that that clause is in the Constitution? Well, as uh, you are well aware, uh, Congressman, uh, our country was founded upon the principles uh, that uh, uh, citizens of the uh, of the country would not be taxed uh, well, but without having Mr. Mr. Mayor, I just wanted you to clarify that, sure. that you didn't you mean that you didn't mean uh, to clarify the record. You didn't mean the Constitution. Point well you taken. It was it was basically a point well taken. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure we get on that so you don't. Uh, Gentlemen, are still recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I appreciate that, um, Mr. Chairman. Too, I just I'm too bad my colleague from Fairfax isn't here because uh, he was talking about what cities don't get to. Uh, um, have self-governance. Quantico is one of them because it's on a federal reservation, and uh, just happens to be uh, for a Virginian to forget that there are there are these cities that are actually encompassed in federal jurisdictions that um, we sort of drive by every day and don't think about the fact that the citizens of Quantico don't elect a mayor, don't have direct representation because the federal government preempts it. Um, I got a question, Mayor. The um, the issue of one of the uh, the scholarship program in D.C., um, which, let me tell you, this is near and dear, especially in a city like this. Um, do you, um, should the program allow new students into the program in the, at the present and the future as we have in the, in the past? Yeah, our administration uh, supports uh, both the three-sector approach uh, and then uh, we have a statement which has been crafted uh, which uh, would allow uh, the continued operations of the program and the same numbers of people in the program, um, which there are some people who would want less, some people who would want more. Um, I, 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 you, could you could classify that as more kids into the program because they're new kids, or you could just classify it as the same number of slots. We have supported the same number of slots. So in other words, you, you support maintaining this into the foreseeable future where if you don't allow new kids in, you're basically designing the demise of the option for the inner city. No, that, no that's, that would be one of the extremes. We are, uh, our administration has uh, adopted a position that's a little bit more in the middle, uh, which would to support the, number, the same number of slots, which would allow uh, new kids in uh, to, a certain, uh, to a certain degree but not uh, any growth in the program. And just the, fun, the quick ex explanation is the chancellor believes that within uh, a short period of time, but probably more in the five to six year range, uh, we will have our school system uh, at a level uh, that uh, we will, it will be a much more solid option for all the kids in the city. 
And Mayor, this is very de delicate for me. I owned a place in D.C. And sadly, um, my wife in, was emphatic that we leave the district because of the educational, the lack of opportunities here. Um, the other issue that's going to be interesting in this city is that um, now that I don't own a place here, but I've, I've got a friend like Bob Filner, where the district now has created a tax penalty for people that are required by federal law not to be residents of D.C., um, but live here and work here. And the district is taxing them basically because they are not residents, and i.e. members of Congress. We legally cannot be a resident, um, a voting uh, resident in D.C., but Bob's tax is more than his partner because he's a congressman and not allowed to do that under federal law. Has anybody even discussed that Catch-22? I know it's small, but this is the kind of situation that exists in a federal city, the, the, the nation's capital, that doesn't exist in other cities. If I've been briefed on that, I, I don't recall. Yield to Dr. Ghani. Let me just say, in reference to the schools as I yield, uh, as we both support uh, the type of school reform that Chancellor Lee has uh, been uh, pushing uh, over the past two years, I, I do believe that the bill uh, before us will allow her to move even faster by having a, a greater understanding of what her ability to spend dollars are. Dr. Gandhi, I don't know if you have any information about the bill. I, I think Mayor spoke quite well on that. Okay. Just like to give them a choice rather than having to pack up and leave like a lot of people have done, sadly. And a lot of people who don't have the financial ability to pack up and leave like I did and give my children those options, those that are in D.C. that don't have that financial ability should be able to have the same opportunities that my children had, um, even though their, their uh, parents don't make the money what a congressman makes. And I appreciate your chance. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Now recognize the uh, distinguished gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me also point out to my friend from California that it was discovered that some of our colleagues uh, who own residences in the District of Columbia were also uh, taking the homestead credit. So uh, just to uh, let them know that it cuts both ways. Let me ask Dr. Gandhi about the bill. Um, this bill removes many of the uh, steps that the district currently goes through to outline spending uh, and, pr and project the district's future fiscal responsibilities. Uh, in the absence of these additional steps, what safeguards uh, will come into effect if the district begins to spend uh, into uh, deficit spending? What, what, what safeguards will be in place? Uh, sir, the institution of independent chief financial officer will assure the mayor, the council chair, and the council, the Congress, and the citizens that we will not have a budget that is not balanced. I am obligated to certify a balanced budget before it moves to the Congress. And if we are given budget autonomy, then we will make sure in our offices that the budget that is put forward by the mayor to the council is properly certified as balanced, and that we would have not only a one-year balanced budget, but a five-year balanced budget. So I think this requirement on the part of the independent chief financial officer in itself is enough to assure the mayor and the council and, of course, the Congress that district will not have unbalanced budgets. And in, in your testimony, you cite the specific benchmarks, the Act details to ensure astute financial management. Can you elaborate a little bit on those benchmarks or, the, or the, those, the, uh, uh, is that the five-year projected budget and the, uh, and the balanced budget? Are those the benchmarks? We, we are, by law uh, and by practice, require a five-year plan. The reason for that is that we want to make sure that the revenues and expenditures are not moved across the years 
so that we would balance in one year but not in the next year. At the end of the day, if there is a recurring expenditure, then it has to be a recurring source. So you balance the budget this year, but also make sure that that, that does not create an unbalanced budget next year. Thank you. Well, every response, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Gray, um, in 2007, at the start of the uh, school's chancellor, Michelle Rees' tenure, uh, a warehouse was discovered with new unopened textbooks that had yet to be distributed. Uh, how will the district's autonomy, autonomy be structured uh, to ensure that an instance like, like this does not occur, uh, again, costing the taxpayer and the district unnecessary funds? Uh, that's a great question, Congressman. It, there, there probably are a couple of different things that uh, having uh, faster moving laws and faster moving budgets uh, will do uh, to allow uh, inspectors uh, uh, review of where spending is going uh, to allow us to get at waste. But I, I would say as the top manager for the city that uh, that one is inexcusable uh, given any set of laws. That's, that's a, a management failure and uh, not knowing where your dollars are being spent and wasted. And I give the Chancellor a tremendous amount of credit in her first months for being able to find uh, wasted resources like that and then direct them to the classroom. Thank you for your response. Mr. Gray, anything to add? Congressman Clay, I, I, I too think that what we're, we're discussing today in terms of budget, budget autonomy and legislative autonomy is less likely to address that. I think that is a management issue. And if you look at some of the additional controls that the district has put in place over the last, let's say, decade, we have an, an inspector general now uh, to whom complaints like this about the operation of services uh, would go. We have an auditor who works with the D.C. Council who looks at complaints around the delivery of services. So. When you look at the, uh, the, the degree to which we've introduced new controls, those kind of management fail failings are more likely to be ferreted out now than perhaps they would have been 15 or 20 years ago, or certainly 35 years ago when limited whole ru home rule was accorded to the District of Columbia. Thank you. Thank, thank the panel for their response. I yield back. Well, uh, I understand we're going to have votes on the floor momentarily. I think this panel has suffered enough. <laughs> and uh, I appreciate you with the generosity of your time and also the quality of your, your testimony. I think you've helped us enormously in, in grappling with this issue. Uh, I trust this will be a, an ongoing dialogue uh, between this subcommittee and, and all of you and on behalf of the district. So uh, I want to thank you for your willingness to come before this subcommittee and help us with our work. Uh,